should be fun. Okay, last class, I believe we left off with the idea of the nuclear arms race. Is that correct? Okay, well, I mean, we had finished the idea of the nuclear arms race. Yes? Okay, and we had talked about the space race a little bit, how the U.S. was blindsided all of a sudden by Soviet technology because up until this point we had felt like we were leading the way in all aspects of the Cold War, and we were feeling pretty good, and then all of a sudden the Soviets put up Sputnik, a Russian-made, Russian-launched satellite that was orbiting the Earth, and all of a sudden we are having panic attacks like you would not believe. We didn't know what it could do. We didn't know, more importantly, what it couldn't do. And people were convinced it had lasers, it had spy technology, it had nuclear weapons. I mean, the thing would have had to have been 50 times the size it was for it to have all the things people thought it might have. But what we did know was while we were sleeping at night, it was orbiting our planet. And that was scary. As scary as the dark is, imagine the dark with something hovering over your house. Like that freaked people out. No, you couldn't see it. But knowing that it was there and not being able to see it made it even more terrifying. Well, actually, you can see it, but it was like a shooting star. Right. Which was hard to discern from other shooting stars. Now, from here, we have the progression to the space race, where the United States decides that this is another area in which we need to compete in order to determine mastery of the world, this time through science. So, we have a crash course program put in place which is aptly named uh, because at the beginning that's all our stuff did was crash or blow up on the launch pad. Meanwhile the Soviets then launch unmanned objects into space like Sputnik and then they launch capsules into space with first dogs. Uh, Belka and Strelka were the two German shepherds that they launched into space and then there was a monkey and then there was Yuri Gagarin. And Yuri Gagarin becomes the first man in space, and that again is an incredible notch in the belt for Russia uh, to show that they are now pulling ahead. And again, the logic of the Cold War is, if they're better than us at something, ergo ipso facto, they must be better than us at other things, therefore they must be better than us, period. That becomes the very paranoid line of reasoning that some people will use and therefore it becomes very, very, very important that we catch up and then surpass the Soviets in space technology to reassert our dominance in this Cold War. Yes, sir? Um, I know we had a bunch of ex-Nazi rocket scientists. Where did the Soviet Union get their rocketry experience from? Ex-Nazi scientists? There was a scramble for German scientists, engineers, biologists, chemists, all of them as the war was ending and we were literally racing each other to get to compounds and bunkers and steal away scientists entice them to come over voluntarily there was a very very competitive market for german scientific knowledge on both sides even as the war was ending sometimes they were politely asked sometimes they were politely told where they would be going sometimes not so politely Okay, so that's all the fun cloak and dagger, almost blow people up stuff of the Cold War. We need to talk a little bit about social issues and domestic issues. We're going to run through this kind of fast because we have... Did I not even hit the start button? Come on, Mr. Ackerman. That's not even close to right now. Uh, what do we have left? 10, 15, I think I've got... 16 minutes left. Okay. So, civil rights movements. Um, thankfully, middle school has taught you much of this. We're not going to go through all the ins and outs of freedom riders and bus boycotts and sit-ins and Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X and all the other people. Hopefully you got that in middle school. If not, go back to middle school. What we're interested in here is the trend the notion of dealing with social injustice, especially in light of now two consecutive world wars in which ethnic minorities from countries around the Western world played an integral role. We saw this with the colonies after World War II. India, Southeast Asia, 
um, sub-Saharan Africa, all of these nations that were either voluntarily or involuntarily dragged into the war are now suddenly clamoring for greater rights because they feel like they've earned it and they feel like in the 20th century it is now ethically and morally wrong to suppress people's rights and freedom simply because of how they look or how they talk or who they worship. And so the civil rights movement in the US, which is what you are most familiar with, is simply a great example of that larger trend. African Americans had fought in both world wars. They had sacrificed overseas and at home along with everybody else, and yet they're still being treated like second-class citizens. They're paid less, they have a harder time buying a home or finding work. You still have the Jim Crow laws in effect in large portions of the U.S. where you have separate but equal, quote unquote, black diners and white diners, black movie theaters, white movie theaters, black drinking fountains, white drinking fountains. And for a long time, American society and Western society had convinced themselves that ideas like separate but equal were totally fine because people needed to be kept separate. And what you begin to see in the 20th century is this sort of social trend of civil rights movements for African Americans and women in the US, but also for ethnic minorities and women throughout the Western world. They've reached the point where they've said enough is enough. We can no longer justify different treatment for different people. Another interesting facet of these social movements are the people that participate. Now obviously your largest you know, percentage of people involved are going to be the people affected. So in the civil rights movement, it's a lot of African American people. In the feminist movement, it's a lot of women. It's about what you would expect. But the other unique characteristic of a lot of these social movements is the involvement of students that are not necessarily from that ethnic or gender background. And we've talked about this a little bit before, I think, but students find themselves in a unique position to be politically active because they do not have the demands on them that adults do. They're not supporting families, they don't have mortgages to pay, they don't always even necessarily have full-time jobs that demand their time and energy. College students in particular, and many of you will find this out in a couple of years, suddenly find themselves with far greater freedom than they've ever experienced and a schedule that allows for much greater flexibility than they have ever experienced. Right now, many of you have a very, very tight calendar. You have to be in school from this time to this time, and then many of you have after-school athletics or clubs or musical organizations or jobs or tutoring or wh whatever it is that you have, and then you come home and you have mandatory homework time and family time and dinner time and all that. When you go off to college, that calendar completely changes. Your class time is significantly minimized. Your homework and, su and study time suddenly becomes very, very independent your social time now radically increases. And so what this allows college students in particular to do is to find things that they care about and invest themselves in that. And so you will see white students, black students, Asian students, Latin American students, people from all over the place, boys and girls, involve themselves in these domestic issues. They also find themselves in an educational environment where they are moving beyond the study of facts and moving into the study of ideas. When you have people majoring in political science or law or ethics or philosophy or create whatever they're into, all of a sudden their world suddenly expands and they begin to start thinking much more broadly than they have before. And many of them find themselves wanting to be involved in these sorts of movements because they feel that there is a larger purpose or a larger issue involved. Now, many people will point disdainfully to them and say, hippie, move on with your life. Hippie. But this points to the power of democracy, that people can actually make a difference when there is a topic that they are passionate about and willfully want to see progress made in. And it's in 
it's not exclusively because of but the student protests play a significant role in the civil rights movement the feminist movements and several other domestic movements of the twentieth century both here and in europe no draft dodgers aren't really a social movement but they will then find themselves in domestic protests against war all right um, other fun trends that we see in the western world we also will see a movement in support of the environment this is a relatively recent phenomenon uh, because during industrialization there weren't that many people that were concerned with the environment or at least their concerns were how can we best profit from the environment which trees can we cut down which mountains can we mine which resources can we extract as quickly as possible we're now 200 years removed from the industrial revolution and we now have the social and economic luxury of becoming concerned about the state of the planet Tarina uh, 20th century post World War II 1950s Nick? So how would you have the luxury of thinking about environmentally if you didn't go back 200 years ago and start... And that's the dilemma, and that's what causes the economic issues of the 20th and 21st centuries, is that the first world nations that have already industrialized a couple hundred years ago now have that benefit and that advantage, and they can worry about and argue for more environmental responsibility those nations that have not yet modernized and industrialized now find themselves at a significant disadvantage because there are laws in place that prevent them from doing exactly what western nations did 200 years ago strip mining deforestation slash and burn agriculture all of those things using um, particularly harmful and harsh chemicals to extract minerals from the ground dumping contaminated chemicals into the most accessible rivers and lakes because it's right there all of those nations now can't follow that model and they now have to play within the guidelines of 21st century environmentalism the upside is it makes the planet a whole lot healthier the economic downside for those countries is the playing field is not level other things that happen we see Europe finally try to put aside its political and cultural differences and unite in the beginnings of what will become the European Union I don't know about that it initially begins as the European common market simply as a way to allow everybody to recover more quickly after World War one sorry World War two because after World War one we saw what didn't work we saw isolation uh, we saw tariffs we saw punitive treatment of Germany and the separation of everybody else from them while still needing to trade with them what we see now after World War two is this sense of cooperation we see tariffs being lowered we see increased trade and decreased restrictions to trade from one European country to the next um, we see an understanding that if we punish certain countries and they then become stronger their growth becomes a threat to us if we're all united and unified even if we're not all friendly we can all benefit from economic resurgence of Germany or France or Great Britain or whomever and that's still the idea that unites the European Union today now obviously they are having problems and they're finding that there are long-term difficulties to having that large a collection of independent nations many of whom still want to do things their own way and those are problems that they're having to resolve but the notion of European cooperation is what drove the the inception of the European Union and it's that idea is still what's allowing them to hold on today. Nick? Is Britain technically part of the European Union? Britain is technically not part of the European Union. They engage in a lot of trade with the European Union, but they do not use the euro. So they like flip them because they keep their power. Right. Emily? It's an economic alliance. Yeah. 
Right. Nick? Are all European Union countries also members of NATO? Or? Uh, pretty much. There may be a couple that are not, but I think by and large, yeah, it's they're overlapping entities. Mari? No, they certainly don't cut themselves off from the world. Um, but the idea is because they're so close together, it makes sense for people in France to be able to go to Spain and work without significant restrictions placed on them. Uh, it makes sense because they're so close and because you can, in a car, drive two hours and be in a completely different country, for them to relax you know, border crossings and um, worker permits and things like that. It makes sense to decrease the taxes and the tolls and the tariffs that a business in France would have to pay to trade goods in Italy. Right, so yeah, it's kind of like how the individual states are. That's a great analogy. It's kind of like, not exactly like, but kind of like how the individual states in the U.S. are within the entity of the United States. We use the same currency. I can go from Virginia to West Virginia and buy and sell goods. There's obviously way more laws involved in that, and that's hugely oversimplified. But yeah, that gives you a general sense of how the European Union works. Okay, um, changes to social hierarchies. Again, not just in the United States, but throughout the Western world. Because of the West's growing prosperity, now that the world wars are over, you are now going to begin to see the trend that you are all now very familiar with. People leaving their homes in developing nations and coming to Western nations for economic opportunity. Why is this happening now? It is. Which technology? Yeah, it's transportation. It's now far more feasible for you to leave your home and go to some place far, far away. I mean, the European migrations during the colonial era, that was not a global trend. And that was not a huge movement of people because it was too hard, it was too complicated, it was too dangerous, and it was too expensive. But now with, 20, with 20th century transportation technology, railroads, airplanes, large passenger ships that can travel long distances relatively cheaply, now all of a sudden it's much more viable. It's still not easy, but it's much more viable if you want to leave your home in Sierra Leone in Africa and go to France and find work and either attempt to bring your whole family with you or you go and earn money and send it back to your family to help support them because you can earn 10 times more money in France than you could in your home country. You see the same thing happening throughout Latin America, not just coming to the United States and Canada, but also going to Western Europe. Tarina? Right. So all of these countries will initially have some sort of legal requirements that people need to satisfy in order to come in. And then as populations continue to grow and those lines get longer and longer, you will then have in all of these nations the issue of illegal immigration. People coming there that do not want to go through the process because the process takes too long and they have families and financial need back home. And so when we talk about changes to social hierarchy, when we talk about immigrant workers, we're talking about both legal immigrants and illegal immigrants. How do all of these people fit into an existing society in the United States or France or Italy or whatever? And like we were talking about up here with the civil rights movement, many of these Western nations are very, very ethnocentric. They have this notion in their mind of what their ideal ethnicity is, the language people should speak the skin color they should have, the religion they should practice. And people in these countries will struggle with additions to their homeland of people that don't seem to fit the mold. And that will become part of civil rights movements and social movements throughout the 20th century and into the 21st century because we're still dealing with these things. And then improvement in peasant status, hopefully that's more or less self-explanatory. Lower classes will see opportunities for improvement in Western countries. Agriculture will be more profitable. 
uh, manufacturing jobs, um, you know, jobs that are available to lower class workers will now be a little bit more better paying, I guess, for lack of a, a better expression. But this obviously doesn't end problems. In some ways, it just creates a whole new series of social issues that we now find ourselves wrestling with today. So this is more a transitionary period. You know, we often like to think of the civil rights movement as having stopped and solved all the problems of race relations. And it doesn't. And I think if you were able to ask a lot of people who would be willing to respond honestly, you would find that it hasn't solved all the problems. There are still problems. And you still have issues with gender roles in a lot of Western nations. Um, so again, this is more just notifying you that this is when you see the major dramatic shifts and movements. It's not when we've solved all the problems. It's on the last slide. What's that? It's on the last slide. Oh, it's pretty awesome. Yeah. Yes, because we don't.